Well, good morning. I have, uh, I have great news for all of you, and that is that uh, I have it on substantial authority that God notices people who come to church when it's raining. So, <laughs> so you, should, uh, you should take some, some comfort in that and, uh, and feel good about that, if nothing else, during Lent. We are talking today about Holy Week and the players in Holy Week, and most especially Judas Iscariot. And that's the person that we're gonna focus on mostly. But in order to do that, we need to, to get to Holy Week. And to get to Holy Week, you have to understand that while the week itself for us at this point in our story is full of incredible meaning and power and symbolism and life-changing things, and it's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on that, and you have to realize that the people who were there during Holy Week had no concept of any of that. So all of the things that you and I bring to Holy Week has to be set aside, okay? That wasn't, that wasn't in anybody's mind. To go into Holy Week itself, where the actual people were who made it up, they have to know that they were preoccupied and in many cases overwhelmed by three realities. The first was, it was the Passover observance. The second was the heavy hand of the Roman Empire. The third was the rebellious instincts of the Jewish population. And the three of them made a powder keg. They had been occupied by the Romans in Jerusalem since 63 BCE. And the Romans and hit Roman history that you learned talked about the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and how they maintained the peace, but it was peace on Roman terms, period, that's it. The banner that the Roman art legions carried before them had the, the, the letters on it, S-P-Q-R, for the Senate and the people of Rome, period. They aspired to nothing higher, they served no higher God. It was for the benefit of the Senate and the people of Rome, period. And the Pax Romana was meant to keep, you know, like that movie, show me the money, keep the cash flowing in towards Rome. Now, that's one element, the very serious part of what goes on. The second is that the, the, the first century Jews were remembering their successful overthrow of the Greeks 160 years before about the same period of time from us to the Civil War. And it was, it was in that case, it was a little like, if you remember the book, The Mouse That Roared, it's a little bit like that, that they ended up winning without really understanding why. But that told them that, that, that they won because God intervened on their behalf. And so the people of Judea, of Jewish people of the first century, expected God's intervention. They expected God to come and free them from this Roman yoke and to get the Romans off their back. And we'll talk a little bit more about how, that, how powerful that feeling was. But they knew that God was going to intervene, that God would bring God's anointed one, in their language that was the Masak, the Masak was going to come. And when that rough Hebrew word got into the hands of the Greeks, it was smoothed out and becomes Messiah, God's anointed one. They were expecting God's anointed one to show up and free them from the Roman yoke. Now the third element is the fuse to this powder keg, because the third element is the Passover, which is, you will recall, the memory of God's intervention in Egypt to free the Jewish people from the Egyptian yoke. Now it doesn't take you know, somebody with a poetic mindset to connect you know, this event where God intervened to rescue our ancestors from the Egyptian yoke and God is ready to intervene and rescue us from the Roman yoke. And so the expectation of the Jewish people is that the Messiah was coming and the Messiah was gonna do it again. The, the Messiah was gonna lead them to freedom, but it was political freedom. It was political freedom, not anything about sins, not anything about any of that stuff. It was political. Now, their preoccupation was with getting out from under the Romans. Now, there are several ways that we know that for sure. And one, and the most significant and important, 
is that, do you know what was the last question that anybody ever asked Jesus on this earth? Now just think for a minute. The last question that anybody ever asked Jesus on this earth. Now, if you're thinking that you're looking at the Gospels, you're wrong. It's not in the Gospels, it's in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And it takes place after everything has happened, after all of the teachings of Jesus, after all the miracles of Jesus, after all of the Last Supper, after the Palm Sunday, after all the things of Holy Week, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and after all the resurrection appearances. And the last question that anybody ever asked Jesus was, Lord, now will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Which was to say, well, this has been swell, Jesus. You know, you know, <laughs> loved, loved the Last Supper. It was just great. But, and the resurrection was a showstopper. There was no question about that. But you know, when are we going to do what we all know we're here to do, which is to kick the Romans out? Now, this is done just before the ascension, and my theory is that that's the reason for the ascension. I think, I think, <laughs> I think Jesus was going, I, and I, I, and right up the sky. Anyway, so that's how deeply this was held. Another indication of that is that the logic of Caiaphas, the high priest, who was why he, they went after Jesus, was this. It is better that one man should die than that the whole nation should suffer. Now, why does he think the whole nation's gonna suffer? Because of the rebellion, because of the rebellion. He's gonna start this, he's gonna light this fuse, there's gonna be the rebellion, and it's better to kill the guy who's gonna light the fuse than let him light the fuse and kill half of Jerusalem. Uh, the threat of rebellion is the reason that Pilate was there. He normally lived in Caesarea Philippi, which is up on the coast, and he was in Jerusalem with his legions because of the threat of that. Um, the, you know, that's the reason that Jesus, or when, when Jesus, when Peter confessed that Jesus was Lord, and Jesus says, yes, and I'm gonna suffer and die, and P Peter says, no, 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 that's not how it's gonna work, because he sees a political Messiah. James and John asked Jesus if they could be on his right hand and his left as they went into, as he came into his kingdom, which shows a splendid misunderstanding of the kingdom, but they were expecting a political kingdom to be there. And the other piece of it is that in the year 70, in the common era, 70, the rebellion did take place. And it was put down by the Romans with such force that the Jewish nation did not reappear for 1,878 years, 1948, before it came back. Now, if you're gonna get squashed, that is squashed, I wanna tell you, that is really being put down. So, so these are not pipe dreams, these are not you know, fantasies, these are real things, and it really happened, and everybody really expected it. So if you were to have an overhead view of Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week, you would see the Roman legions marching down from Caesarea Philippi. They would say marching up to Jerusalem because you always go up when you're going to Jerusalem, no matter which direction you're going. But it, they were going south. You would see Jesus coming in at Palm Sunday, another direction. You would see Jewish people converging from every direction. And in the middle, you would see the high priests at the temple and they are the focal point of this. And the tension is building up at an incredible rate and power. You know, it's like the British marching toward Lexington and Concord. It's like Martin Luther King leading groups on the Pettus Bridge in Selma. You know, it, you, something's gonna happen you know, when this irresistible force and this immovable object come together, something's gonna happen and it isn't gonna be good. So everybody in Jerusalem at that point, you know, basically was either there to start a war or prevent one. And that was the prevailing attitude that's there. So if you have that mindset and you enter into that picture, now, <clears throat> what does Palm Sunday look like to you? What does Palm Sunday become in that atmosphere? It becomes the beginning of the rebellion. Hosanna to the son of David. David is the George Washington. David is the warrior king. It's the re beginning of the rebellion. Now, I'm sure that the piety of the clergy here will point out that Jesus came in on a colt, 
which is a symbol of peace. But nobody picked that up, partly because the opposite the, of Jesus coming in on a war horse, they didn't have a war horse. So there wasn't any question, you know, the donkey was the only thing they had. So the fact that the donkey is a symbol of peace would not have occurred to anybody until much later when pious people like the clergy of St. Paul's began to interpret those events. So Jesus comes in, people are singing Hosanna to the son of David, the warrior king, and the rebellion is now bubbling up. The, the, the match is that close to the fuse. We're getting ready to go. This is going to be it. And so what happened is that Jesus goes in and he goes to the temple. And he drives out the money changers. That's strange. I mean, why would he do that? I mean, these are our guys. They're, they're, they're slimy guys, but they're our guys, you know. And the Romans are right there. There's a thing called the Antonium, which is built as a, a, a butts the, the temple. So they were, the Romans were right there, but he didn't go there. He went to the temple. And then he went back out to Bethany. And you're thinking, wait a minute, what's going on here? And on Monday, he goes back into town and he goes and he argues with the Pharisees. Tuesday, into town, argues with the Pharisees, back to Bethany, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. Wednesday, goes back into town, argues with the Pharisees. The momentum is slipping away. The momentum is being lost. And then Wednesday night, there is an event that is recorded in all of the Gospels. This is John's account. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointing Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? So there's Judas introduced. So let's go into the mind of Judas. And let's assume that Judas, like everybody else, believes that the role of the Messiah is to be the political military leader who frees them from the Roman occupation. And so Judas watches Jesus claim the role on Palm Sunday and then fritter it away on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And so the anointing in Bethany becomes, I think for Judas, the straw that broke the camel's back. That if we have this person who's here to lead the rebellion, who's here to take us into the mouth of this and to deliver us from, from the Romans by God's grace. And he's out here being fawned over by somebody with a whole lot of perfume. How do we get him back on message in our own terms? How do you get him back on message? How do you get him to remember what he's there for? His answer, I think, is force his hand. Force his hand. Make him do what he came to do. He's, he's forgotten somehow. He's gotten distracted, not unlike the current White House. He's gotten distracted. He's wandering off. It's, how do you get him back to this? So the questions, the traditional thing is that Judas betrayed Jesus for spite, that Judas wanted him killed. Well, if that's true, I would say that suicide is a reasonably odd way to celebrate victory, if that's what you really wanted. Then, okay, Judas did it for the money. Well, no, he tried to return the money, which is if you did it for the money, it doesn't make any sense either. So why did he do it? Get him back on message, force his hand. He's not doing what everybody knows he's supposed to do. And here comes the plan in Judas's mind. We turn him over to the high priest. If we turn him over to the high priest, he's gonna have to He's going to have to fight. He's going to have to remember what he's there for because the high priest is going to take him. And if he does that, he's going to have to fight. Now, there's a problem, though. 
how do you get, how does Judas, a revolutionary, get Caiaphas, who's in charge of keeping the peace, to arrest Jesus this way? How do they show common cause? Because you remember, Caiaphas is there to stop the war. Judas is there to start one. So how do you bridge the gap? How do you get these two people to be in common cause? 30 pieces of silver. That's what you do. You go to Caiaphas and you say, I will betray him if you'll give me 30 pieces of silver. If you'll give me money, I will betray him. That's a language that everybody understands. Caiaphas takes the bait. Now, it's risky. It's risky. So what happens, what happens if it doesn't work? Well, what happens if Jesus folds? What happens if he's captured by Caiaphas and the, and the Roman authority, or the, the temple authorities, and he doesn't fight? Well, there's a plan B. There's a plan B that hardly anybody ever knows anything about. But there is a law, and it's in the book of Deuteronomy. It's in the 13th chapter. It's the first five verses, if you're keeping track of these things. Listen carefully to what this says. If prophets or those who divine by dreams appear among you and promise you omens and portents, and the omens and the portents declared by them take place, and they say, let us follow other gods whom we have not known, and let us serve them, you must not heed the words of those prophets or those who divine by dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. But those prophets or those who divine by dreams shall be put to death for having spoken treason against the Lord your God. And so you shall purge the evil from your midst. In other words, if somebody comes along and shows signs and portents, and the signs and portents really happen, healings, feedings, walking on the water, all that kind of stuff. And if that person, in spite of their obvious power, wants you to do something that you know is different from what God wants you to do, and Judas knows for sure that God wants them, wants them to, in, to free the people of Israel, so if he does something that, that leads you to another path from what you know is the truth, that prophet has to die. Deuteronomy. So there's plan B. There's the fail-safe connection. There's how Jesus, Judas knows that he's going to be right no matter what he does. So if he forces Jesus' hand and Jesus has to fight, then the rebellion is on and off we go. Good. If, in fact, Jesus caves, then he was never the Messiah in the first place, and he's called them to do something they weren't supposed to do, and he should die. Foolproof plan. Well, now, you and I, because we are steeped in the lore of this, got to wonder, how did... Judas missed the meaning of the Last Supper, for example. The Supper where Jesus talked about leaders as servants. Well, you have to realize that the Gospel accounts are written some 30 to 70 years after the fact. So you had time to think it through in a way that Judas really didn't. The primary symbol of the Last Supper would have been the Passover, the recollection of God's intervention on behalf of Israel to free them from the Egyptian domination, which is the very thing that the Messiah is supposed to do. So there's the Passover meal, kind of like the Fourth of July fireworks or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. The bread and wine were reinterpreted by Jesus, but not with any clarity. And you can't hold Judas accountable for not having figured it out because, frankly, we haven't either. So, you know, and we've just had 2,000 years to mull it over, and he had two days. So, so he didn't come up with a clear answer there. And then Judas, and here's the clincher for all of us who are Judah, Judas bashers. During the evening, Jesus foretold his betrayal and said to the disciples, one of you will betray me. And everybody in the room said, 
is it I? Because everybody in the room was ready to do it. Everybody in the room had it in their mind. If Jesus had said, you know, one of you is going to turn out to actually be Chinese and move from here to Hong Kong, nobody would say, is it I? If Jesus had said, one of you is going to start flapping your arms and fly around the room, nobody would have said, is it I? Because they knew that's not possible. But one of you will betray me? Uh-oh. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Well, so, then there is another piece to kind of top it all off. Read about this exchange as part of the Last Supper. Jesus said to them, when I sent you out without a purse or a bag or sandals, did you lack anything? I said, no, not a thing. He said to them, now, the one who has a purse must take it and likewise a bag, and the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. Now, that's revolutionary talk. That's revolutionary. You've got to sell your cloak and buy one, for I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me, quote, and he was counted among the lawless, unquote. And indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. And they said, Lord, here are two swords. Jesus said, that's enough. Now, what are they doing with two swords? Well, that's, that's the rebellion. But he says, it's enough. Now, it's enough. You've got to remember that it's enough was said by the guy who fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. What's he going to do with two swords? I think that is enough. In his hand, it is enough. He was still at that point talking the revolution according to Luke's account of the Last Supper, and Judas would have heard it. He's talking it, but he's not walking it. He's not doing it. He's still giving them the revolutionary signals, the Passover, the swords, all that sort of thing. Everybody in the room is thinking that he's off message, ready to betray him. So, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, this account from Matthew's Gospel. Suddenly, one of those, they, they come and they, they arrest him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. Frankly, Yes, you could appeal to your father. That's what messiahs do. Appeal to their father and are accompanied by 12 legions of angels, which would outnumber the Romans substantially. But when the 12 legions of angels don't show up, Judas's plan begins to unravel. Because Judas is really counting on seeing and finding and being met by those 12 legions of angels. So Judas went out and hung himself. Now, why not let plan B go into effect? Why not just let Jesus die because he's a false messiah? And here's the turning point. I think that Judas got a glimpse, the barest, of glimpses, but a glimpse nonetheless of what Jesus was all about and what the messiahship of Jesus was all about. I think that Judas took his own life after Jesus' death, but before the resurrection, so he did not see the whole story. The part that he did see was Jesus accepting death as part of something larger than life. What he did see was Jesus as a martyr. A martyr is a word that means witness, but witnessing to what? Witnessing to what? Why would Jesus just go and die? I think maybe, maybe in the dimmest of ways that Judas realized that Jesus never spoke of the kingdom of David. He always spoke of the kingdom of God. And they are different. I think perhaps he sensed that political kingdoms, the kingdom of David, are by nature self-centered and self-serving. 
and that a kingdom of God must be just the opposite, other-centered and self-giving. And maybe, maybe he realized that his understanding of Jesus <coughs> and the act of betrayal that grew out of that understanding were not only wrong, but absolutely backwards. If that is true, if that is true, then Judas the betrayer is in a rudimentary form the first believer, the first person to begin to understand what Jesus was about. And with that dim understanding of what Jesus was about, all he had was Good Friday and no Easter, and it crushed him, <coughs> which is what would happen to any believer who had Good Friday and no Easter. So, there's Judas. Any questions? Yes, sir. I still don't, I'm not understanding the, the whole logic of the narrative, especially Judas' role. Jesus rolls into Jerusalem on Sunday, and then he goes to the temple the next day, and then he's arguing with the Pharisees. So, so he is like right out in the open. But this whole idea of betrayal where they capture him at night is sort of like, you know, he's in hiding like, like Osama bin Laden, but, but just the opposite. So, you know, since he's been out in with people in the leadership every day, it seems to me that the next day he'd probably go out there again. He was, yeah, so, barely so. Mm -hmm. so. So why wouldn't they just arrest him then? And then... If that's the oh, case, then thank you. Judas, there's, there's no reason for Judas to quote unquote betray him. Well, I think that's a good, that's a good, good point. I, I think the answer is that, that there is a, a lot of expectation that Jesus is the Messiah and that arresting him in public is going to tick off, you know, start the rebellion. Arresting Jesus in the middle of the night and you got to remember, there are no street lights, there's no ambient light, there's no nothing. So it's, I mean, dark is dark. And so arresting him at night, that's safer for the Jewish authorities to do than to haul him off in the daytime. So I think that, uh, you know, that, that going after Jesus in the daytime, he's safe in the, in, in, in the daytime with the light and the people all around him. You know, it, nighttime is his vulnerable time. So I, I think that that's the reason for the reversal. That's... You know, and, and, and of course, you know, it, one of the nice things about biblical fracking, which is what, what this is, is that you know, we are unencumbered by any real knowledge of what went on. So we're, we're able to cover a lot of ground. But I, but I think it's logical that, that that would be the case. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Is it possible that Judas thought that people would rally around Jesus and uh, ask for his freedom rather than his grass? Yes. But I, I, yes. Uh, probably. Uh, that would be a piece of it that he expected people to rally around Jesus. Of course, that came after, the, after he was captured and in custody, which is past the, the prime moment that I think Judas was looking for. Uh, he would have looked you know, for the crowd to do that. I don't know at that point, it's hard to tell whether Judas was about to commit suicide, had committed suicide. I, I don't know. I just, it's, those timelines are not clear, but I think he would have expected that. But I think his plan was in the public, light the fuse, get going right there, not wait until Jesus is in the, in the, in the jail, and, which is where he was at that point. But I think he would have expected that. Yeah, Amy? If it hadn't been Judas, would it have been someone else? I, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? I well, I mean, in terms of the drama of the kingdom of God, as we understand it now, yes, somebody played that part, you know, uh, and that's how we understand it. But we understand that in retrospect. I, I, I don't know. Uh, if not this Passover, maybe the next one. I, I, I mean, it's, it's really hard to tell. But every, there were a lot of people ready. I think that Judas had, you know, the the, the courage of his convictions or the blindness of his convictions, depending on what you think. But I, I mean, he was ready to do it, but I think a lot of people were ready to do it. Our construct that the death of Jesus is, is, a, is a pivotal um, 
uh, moment in his messiahship and our salvation is is attended thereby is that's that's our reading reading back and and could it have been otherwise yeah i guess so but but this is the one we've got so uh, i i so maybe it had to happen and if, and if that if that was really built built into it yes and if not judas then uh the simon the zealot or you know, there, there were there were obviously from the Last Supper inquiry. There were plenty of candidates who were ready to do it. Uh, Judas did. Peter says that Judas committed suicide because he knew that he would go to hell and that Jesus would come. Well, that's a fairly prescient uh, approach to suicide. <laughs> Fine. I. Okay. All right. I. I mean. Right. And that right. That, right. And and there 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 are lots of as you know factors in that. The the our ancestors thought there was that the that the that the that the entire universe was like a shell game. You know that there were there were only three places that the that the P could be: It'd be heaven, earth, or hell. And so if well if Jesus was killed and not on earth and he hadn't gone to heaven yet, then the only place he could be was hell. Which I mean, that, those are those are kind of later constructs, and um, I can't, I can't. I mean, it, it it stretches my mind to to think that Judas would sit there and say, "Well, wait a minute. If I kill myself, and Jesus is going to come and get me, I that seems like a bold plan to me." But I, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Jim. Dr. Wayne, is your storyline documented in a book, multiple books? It's documented in a book that's about to come out that I'm going to sell. <laughs> I, yeah, the, <laughs> <they're> right. <laughs> yeah, there's a, uh, the, uh, we we talked the first time. There's a, there's a book uh, called Biblical Fracking that I'm that I'm. It's it's in the hands of a publisher now, and and the Judas story is is in it. Is one of them. So, yes, sir. You know, the way you're responding to what you said, the way that you set it up, you describe the situation. That must be heavily documented. The well, the well, the excuse, excuse me. Go ahead. The, yeah, the, the the externals the the externals the biblical quotes are biblical quotes the historic statements are historic statements so yes there's that entering taking that and making the mind of Judas is you know that's I mean that's that's free fall that's that's what I'm doing but but it's but but the document the things around it are true I mean th those are those are you know you know discernible. Uh, pieces of, inf of information. The conclusions to which I come are my own. No. Yes, ma'am. I mean, this is not a question as much as I, you know, I've mentioned I have younger kids and my son is super interested in history and it's just thought about like youth education. And I feel like this kind of, the, I didn't, I mean, I grew up going to the Episcopal church and didn't really think about Jesus and Palm Sunday in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, the, getting away from, you know, the war and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I mean, my son would go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and this would be an amazing, I mean, can you imagine Julian and Thomas well, talking about, yeah. like, the war and all this kind mm -hmm. of thing? I think it would be an amazing, I mean, youth um, yeah. seminar for, I mean, if you wanted to get kids interested in the history of the Bible, that, I mean, that would be, I mean, I know that would be a ton of work for some well, of the other but, I mean, if you wanted to get kids interested in history of the Bible. Well, it, yeah, I, as, as you say that, I'm, I'm reminded that Socrates was killed for corrupting the youth of Athens. And I, I I'm, not sure that, I'm not sure that I'm ready to go down that road all the way. But, but, I, think, but I, I, think, I think one thing that's essential, I mean, I, I, I mean it, it interests me. This is the reason I'm doing it. But it interests me. But I think it's important that you have the basics before you do the before you do the extrapolation, I, you know, because if you, the, because if you if you talk about this with, with children who are too young that don't know the basic story, then then my construct becomes their basic story, and I, I think that's really as that's that's but more. Basic story. They don't really get into. I mean, the basic story is so basic for youth, at least in my education of the Bible. 
Bible growing up. The mm -hmm. Sunday doesn't talk about the history of the Bible. Right. Much. I just think that is so bad. Well, it, it's really hard, I think, to, to understand Palm Sunday apart from the, the anticipation of rebellion. You know, that, that nothing anybody does makes any sense apart from that, from that fact. Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, Judas, you know, all of them are acting with, with that. And then you've got to wonder, you know, well, okay, knowing that, why did Jesus come walking in that way? I mean, so, so he, I mean, he's that, and that could be to Amy's point, you know, setting up, you know, kind of, it, 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 it the possibilities, you know, get, get fuzzy. Elizabeth? Right. Well, I, I think uh, yes, certainly that is a possibility. I another piece of that is that uh, that the gospel writers, especially John, carries a burden of believing that Jesus knew everything and was always right, and so he, you know, he, you know, that if you'd ask him if if the Wright brothers were gonna fly a plane, he just said yes, and over in North Carolina. I mean, he, he had all, that was John's take on Jesus. And so that, that take, that understanding of Jesus is represented in that, in that kind of a story. I, and there's no way to know, you know what that is. I, I think that if, if, because we as Christians, like taking Amy's point, we as Christians understand the death of Jesus to be basic, to the, to the unveiling of our salvation, if not to the realization of that salvation. You know, but but that, that's a really important part of the story. So that would have Jesus accepting and going to that death, and that's what he's talking about in Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me, all that, that sort of thing. And so he, was, he knew where he had to go, and that it was a, a martyr's death and not a very nice one at that. And so uh, the fact that he could say that to Judas perhaps recognizing that Judas was the one most likely to pull the trigger on this. Uh, I don't know. I mean, but you, you know, it, you know, there, it's, there, all of those things come together. It's really hard to say. I think it's one thing to take on the mind of Judas with whom, you know, I at least have some identity as a human being, uh, you know, taking in the mind of Jesus, which we understand to be a, you know, a perfect blending of the divine and the human, you know, is, I, I don't go to that. <laughs> I don't go to that side of the street yet. I don't, don't, know, how to, don't know. I'm not sure how to do that. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, speaking, I guess, to that, it seems like Jesus must have been a little disappointed that his disciples thought that he was supposed to be out there with his sword doing all this. They didn't really get the message until his resurrection. He, uh, hey, guess what? We're talking something totally different. Here. Right. That's right. That's right. And and even after the resurrection, he the last question he gets is. This has been swell. Let's go get the Romans. You know, it's it's uh, you know. So it's I mean it's it's really embedded. I mean it's really it's it's hard to. They, just didn't get it. they didn't get it. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. And uh, you know they it it's really you know it it's it's difficult to to describe how hard it is for a preconceived notion to give way to something else. Another person who struggles with that in the gospel stories is Nicodemus, who can't get Jesus to, to make any sense in terms of his preconceived notions. So it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, it really is hard. And, and this is not just the idea that Judas or somebody has, it's everybody has it. Pilate has it, Caiaphas has it, everybody on the street has it, you know. I bet there were lots of people who said, we're not going to Jerusalem this year because it's a powder keg. I, I don't want to go there. I, so I bet there were lots of people back in Nazareth or Capernaum or someplace that said, we're not going this year because it's too dangerous. I, you know, because I, I think that was there, but it's, it's hard to tell. And, and I think that, you know, again, when we do the, the, the purpose of fracking is to gain insight into God and us. And I think that the question that, the good question that you're raising, uh, holds up for us our own preconceived notions. You know, what, what might be so embedded in me that, that I'm not ready to, you know, 
to, you know, to hear cannot hear uh, what's, what's going on. So, yes, sir. What I would view is the logical outgrowth the scene you just described with in the last question is why it took 60 years to record the gospel because they were wait they were waiting for that revolution. Right. And, you know, and everyone thought the second coming was imminent. And right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They, 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 it took them, frankly, it took, it took the gospel writer 60 years to get it. Right. Yeah, and, and that and you're right that the, the the main reason for the delay in writing the Gospels is because they expected the world to end, you know, Thursday morning noon, you know, real soon. I mean, it's right right away, and and so sitting down and writing a narrative of what happened didn't make a lot of sense until the second generation, second generation begins to think we better get the story that Granddad told, you know, and get it down. And so that's that's where it comes out. Mm -hmm. But that only makes sense in the context that they're they're wait, they're waiting for the revolution. They're waiting for the second coming. Well, actually, the revolution the revolution that the that the Christian community was waiting for was not against Rome. It was against Satan. It was the end of the world, not not the end of the Roman Empire, but the end of the world. So they, but but yes, the same terminology that, but but not the same, not the same focus in that. The early Christian church saw Jesus coming again to end not just the Roman Empire, but the whole shebang. And, and that was, that's what they thought. And that's, that's one of the, there's another kind of a tangent on that, you know, that the, that the Christian, the Christian church was, you know, we got, we got kicked out of Judaism because we thought, uh, not because we thought Jesus was a Messiah, because in this first century, you know, there were more Messiahs than there were, than there are Democratic candidates for president now. I mean, everybody, <laughs> there were Messiahs all over the place. So you can, no problem about thinking somebody was a Messiah. We separated from Judaism over the question of the inclusion of Gentiles. And when we began to include Gentiles, then they said, there's no place for you here. So we lost the protection of, the, of being a sect of Judaism. And with it, we lost the, the support of Rome because we fell outside there. So that, that starts the persecutions and all that kind of stuff. And, and, the, and the central tenet that we held onto turned out to be wrong, which is, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but the world hasn't ended and here we are. So, uh, so you know, you, that's a tribute to the experience of, of God as the Holy Spirit, the, the ongoing experience of God, which sustained us through that loss of, of relationship with the parent bodies, Judaism and, the, and society, and being gloriously wrong at the top of our voices about Jesus coming again. And it was the ongoing experience of God that held us together. That's a whole nother talk we can do. But. That, that, in that case, but you're, you're quite right. That's why they waited so long. And, and that makes the, in some ways, that makes the, the gospel accounts sketchy. In another way, it makes them more welcoming you know, because they're, it, they're not nailed down. They're not really tight. And so there's a place for 21st century Americans and the, as there was a place for, you know, fifth century Greeks, you know, so to, to, to enter into it. So there you are. There's Amy's hand guiding creation and everything like that. So, uh, how are we doing here? Okay, we, another, got time for another question or two? Oh. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, Karen. I just can't help seeing and hearing the scenes from Jesus Christ Superstar. Superstar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> treatment of Judas mm -hmm. disappointment in Jesus. Right, right. Uh, and Jesus Christ Superstar is you know, is, does, does portray Judas in, you know, a little more, he's a little hyper, I think, but, but, uh, but, but he's, uh, but then, you know, so is everybody else, but, but the, he's, uh, in, in that one, it's, yeah, it's, it's opera. But, you know, one thing is that, uh, that the, that the kind of drama that, uh, the passion narrative that, that that is only goes to the death. It doesn't go to the resurrection traditionally in that, in that genre. So, so you're able to see the story as it stands here without resurrection in the same way that it did there. But Judas comes off a little, you know, as, as having reasons, you know, for, for what he's doing. He's not just a bad guy. Uh, and, I'm sorry? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, I mean, there are amazing portrayals of all this. I mean, there, there really are. And, uh, you know, the, the, the question here, what, what, what I'm trying to do is to, is to go into the mind of Judas. And, and it's the, it's the in, me, in my mind, it's the danger of forcing God's hand, you know, 
I know this is what God wants, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it up so God has to do what I expect. And that's, that's Judas's mistake, I think. So, so, anything else? Okay, well, thank you all so much for your time.